I would like to share with you in this episode of Footsteps to Heaven my own personal story about how I met the Holy Spirit. What's your relationship with the Holy Spirit like? Do you know the Holy Spirit on a personal basis, as a personal friend? Or is the Holy Spirit something like he used to be for me, just something ethereal, some ghostly image of God, um, you know, something that, you know, he's the Spirit of Christ in the world today. And what, what do you do with that? Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to teach us what we need to know in our everyday lives of following Christ. Christ told us before he ascended into heaven, he told the disciples, which includes you and me now, he told us that he would not abandon us. He would not leave us orphaned. He would he was going to the Father in heaven, but he was going to give us the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a very, very important part of the life of a Christian and the plans for the kingdom of God. Jesus said that he had to ascend into heaven so that the Holy Spirit could come to us, could come to the world. The Holy Spirit is given to us to live the way Jesus told us we can live and are called to live. Jesus told us many things. He gave us by his example how we're supposed to live as Christians. And then the first apostles and the first Christians, they all show us today, read the book of Acts to see what they show us today about how to live the Christian life. The Christian community life, the Christian life of ministry and providing healing to the world, to people who come seeking healing, deliverance from demons, preaching the word, preaching the truth and doing it boldly and miracles happening. If it happened then, it could happen today, but it doesn't happen today because we are not fully the church, we, as a body of Christ on earth, are not as alive in the Holy Spirit, as not are not as empowered and activated. The, the Holy Spirit hasn't withheld any of his power, but we are not fully availing ourselves of the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not fully saying, Lord, I have sinned and I want to live a holy life. Help me. That's why the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit was given to us in baptism so that we could live the holy life. We could strive to become the saints that we are called to be. And, you know, sainthood, heroic sainthood, is not just for a select few. We're all called to it. It's only a select few take it that seriously that they take it to the nth degree. And God does give some people special graces from from early, early on, even from the womb, like St. Joseph, for example, to live a very grace-filled life. And you know, Mary's Immaculate Conception, she was born without original sin, so she could be totally filled with the Holy Spirit so that she, she didn't sin because she was so filled with the Holy Spirit. Most of us, God's plan is that he wants us to come to him and say, come Holy Spirit, fill me. Come Holy Spirit, renew me. Come Holy Spirit, I do want to be holy. I do regret my sins. I do want to become more aware of what my sins are. I do want you to change me. I do want to live the life that you are calling me to. Even if it means sacrificing things that I don't really want to sacrifice. At this moment, I don't... I hope he doesn't ask me to sacrifice this or this or that. Come Holy Spirit, you have my permission to change me. That needs to be our daily prayer. I grew up not knowing the Holy Spirit's role in my life. I didn't know that he has been made available to help me to be a holy saint. 
All I knew was that Jesus was my Savior, and as my Savior, he was my best friend, my best ally. Um, you know, he, he helped me when I prayed, and, and, you know, he was a very important part of my life. But when we don't have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, no matter how much we love Jesus, we have big holes in our armor. You know, Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of faith that we're to wear. We have big holes in our armor that demons can get through. It's the ability to feed us lies and trick us. When we are not filled and, and totally taken over by the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is not possessing us so fully that our every waking moment is connected to the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit, um, relying on the Holy Spirit, being aware that if we are not relying on the Holy Spirit, we are going to sin, we're going to fall, we're going to, to do things that we'll later regret. The Holy Spirit is God in us to help us be all that God created us to be. And that includes being able to recognize when the devil's trying to trick us, when the devil is lying to us or the world is lying to us. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is called discernment. The discernment of spirits, knowing good from bad, knowing whose voice we're hearing. You know, when we get an idea into our head, is it from God? Is it our own human ideas? Or is it something from a demon, a temptation, a, a lie, um, maybe that the world has given us, has, has promoted through the media or through false information that's been passed on to us through well-meaning people. The, there is so much confusion and there is so much out there that is not true that we think we, we can detect when it's true or not. We think we've got good common sense that helps us understand what's true and not. And sometimes God doesn't work with common sense, by the way. Sometimes it's supernatural and it goes against logic. But the foundation of the Holy Spirit at work in us is the gift of common sense. When a demon is trying to trick us, if we are humble, we can use common sense to say, wait a minute, that's, there's something not right about that. That doesn't make sense. Because demons often work, for example, through fear. And fear works against common sense, but sometimes feels like common sense. Now, I'm not talking about fear like, don't stick your hand in the fire because, you know, you can get burned because you will get burned. I'm talking about fear that's irrational, fear that interferes with the quality of our life, fear that causes anxiety, fear that takes our minds off of God and and keeps us from trusting the Lord. One of my favorite prayers is, Lord Jesus, I trust in you. Take care of everything. And then go on my way. You know, just leaving it in the hands of God. Fear says, you can't say that. You've got to you've got to figure out there's a problem here and you've got to solve it. And if God's not solving it fast enough, you've got to take matters into your own hands. There's many lies that fear tells us. Fear, take those letters that spell fear, F-E-A-R. Fear stands for false evidence appearing real. When we rely on the Holy Spirit, we can detect what is false. There's something in us that goes, Wang! Something's not right about that. You know, I call it warning flags from the Holy Spirit. Something's uneasy in my spirit about it. And, and I need to pay attention to that and pray. Why am I feeling uneasy about that? What's making me uncomfortable? What's the message of fear? What's the lie in the fear? Fear is usually 
based on something true and then takes it to a level that makes us distrust the Lord or interferes with our quality of life or causes us to sin or, um, or, or just makes us live in anxiety when Jesus is saying, peace be with you. Fear takes a truth and applies a non-truth to it to control us. That's how the spirit of fear works. And the Holy Spirit says, I am the spirit of truth. I am giving you the truth. Pay attention and I will anoint you with the truth and you'll be able to tell what's not of me and what is of me. You'll be able to know when you're being tempted. You'll be able to know when you're hearing something that's not true. You know, this even goes so far as, as being able to discern when somebody's lying to us. And the Holy Spirit says, Boing! that's not true. You know, like my little sound effects of what the Holy Spirit sounds like. Boing! <laughs> There's something inside of us that goes, whoa, pay attention to the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit's trying to say. All of this that I'm, I'm talking about here is the reason why it's so important, especially today, to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to share with you how I met the Holy Spirit. Like I said before, I loved Jesus. I was a very devout follower of Jesus. But because I didn't have the Holy Spirit as in a personal relationship, yes, I had the Holy Spirit in me through baptism, but I was not living an active life in the Holy Spirit. I did not know how to do that. I didn't know I could. I didn't know there was an option. And because of that, demons were able to trick me into believing lies. The way they tricked me, they found a vulnerability. My vulnerability was I had read in scripture about the miracles that took place and I said, Lord, why aren't there miracles today? And so I went seeking the supernatural and I didn't find it in my church. It was just like you pray because it's a nice thing to do and you hope for the best and you know that if good comes out of the prayer, God had something to do with that. That's not a very powerful faith. As true as it might be, it's not very powerful. It's not very life-changing. It doesn't convert sinners. It doesn't bring the non-believers to church. What happened to me was I went seeking the supernatural and the only place I found it was in the occult. It started with the Ouija board, played with that, and when it started working supernaturally, uh, it gave answers that the person that I was playing this Ouija board quote unquote game with, uh, you know, the, we asked questions that we did not know the answers to and the correct answers came. And from there it led to, you know, my curiosity was in, in, in seances and palm reading and divination and uh, anything at all. I just went from one thing to another seeking to have the supernatural in my life. The only thing I didn't experiment with was Satan worship because I did not believe that demons were real. That's one thing that, it's one of the tricks that the devil loves to do. They like to hide. They like to tell you that they're not in your life and even that they don't exist so that we can be more easily tricked. I was told by a well-meaning friend, a very faith-filled Christian friend, that that I was messing with demons when I had seances, that I was in, actually in contact with demons, but I didn't believe her. Uh, she gave me a book about it. I didn't believe the author of the book because I was now under the influence of these demons who were giving me lies. And the Holy Spirit was not active enough in my life for me to recognize his little boing, you know, his warning flags. So I got sucked deeper and deeper into the occult. 
after seven years of involvement in the occult, I didn't want anything else to do with Jesus. Very subtly and slowly, demons had pulled me away from Christ. It was never my intention. Like I said, I was a devout follower of Christ. And I even took Jesus with me into the seances. <laughs> I thought I was evangelizing ghosts. I thought when I contacted through seances spirits, I believed the lie that's promulgated very commonly that these were people who had died and they just did not know how to get to heaven. I didn't believe hell was real. Well, maybe it was real, but very few people go there, you know. I, that was where I was, my where my beliefs were at that point. And so I said, you know, Jesus, you know, help me to contact spirits who need to be helped into heaven. And I thought I was evangelizing humans who had died. I told, when we had the seances, I told the spirits that I was talking to about Jesus. I said, look for Jesus and he will take you to heaven. And as soon as I said that, the spirits left. And I thought, yay, we got somebody else into heaven. And in fact, the demons were fleeing because they can't stand the name of Jesus. And when, when I said, look for Jesus, they're like, no way, I'm out of here. But as much as I thought I was bringing Jesus into the seances, he wasn't coming with me because Jesus does not go into sin with us. And so I basically left Jesus, you know, outside the door, so to speak, when I went into seances. And in that territory where I was without Jesus, the, the demons were able to, to have much more freedoms with me. And I came out believing that, yeah, Jesus was real, but I didn't need him in my life. I came out with a spirit of rebellion, a spirit of rebellion that had been passed on to me. It was a generational spirit. And, I mean, think about it. I grew up Protestant. Protestant means rebellious, okay? And in that spirit of rebellion, I really got into some things that... I regret to this day. I'm not ashamed of it because shame has been removed from me through the sacrament of confession. But I know it was wrong and I regret it. And if I can help somebody else avoid the same thing, you know darn well I'm going to try to do that. See, God turns everything into good. When we realize that we have sinned and we go to confession and we receive the fullness of grace, confession gives us graces, supernatural graces that we don't get just by going directly to God for forgiveness. And when we receive all of that grace, then God wants us to help others receive it too. So what's bad is turned into ministry, but that's a whole other topic. What I want to talk about and continue talking about right now is how the Holy Spirit got a hold of me. After being in this state of mess, not the state of grace, the state of mess, where I, I really was getting more and more into sin through rebellion and other things as well, Jesus rescued me. He brought into my life somebody who had just been ordained a priest and we met on vacation just before he became a priest and just before uh, I finished high school and then after high school uh, a couple years later Ralph and I got married and after our wedding day this priest who had had his ordination the same year as our our wedding you know, he came to visit us and while he was visiting us, he told us that on the weekend he wanted to celebrate Mass. Now, me and my spirit of rebellion was like, oh, come on, you don't need to go to Mass every weekend. You know, you, you can live just fine without going to Mass. But he insisted. I tried to corrupt him, but he insisted. So I said, okay, I'll take you to Mass. And he knew that I was going to be watching him by being in the congregation. I was going to 
watch my friend, you know, and see, just, just, just to be there just because he was my friend, not because I wanted to go to Mass. So he explained to me that, by the way, when everybody comes up for communion, you cannot receive communion. Don't come up because you're you're Protestant, you, you, you're not Catholic, you can't receive communion. And well, the spirit of rebellion and the spirit of Protestantism, the spirit of confusion, the spirit of lies came out and said, I said to my friend, I said, no, that can't be. If you came to my church, you'd be allowed to, re to have communion. So my friend said, you can't receive communion because you don't believe it's really Jesus. That supernaturally, through transubstantiation, and he explained to me what that is, it's really Jesus. And I said, well, if it's really Jesus, then don't deny it to me. Let me, let me get Jesus. See, the Holy Spirit was beginning to stir up within me. The Holy Spirit from my baptism was beginning to stir up within me. I heard this truth about the transubstantiation of the bread and the wine being transformed into Jesus himself, fully present divinity and, and, and physically present, both body and divinity in the Eucharist, and we can receive that and take Jesus fully into ourselves that way and be consumed by Jesus in the process. It's a unity that takes place. And the Holy Spirit gave me this instant belief, this instant awareness that, yes, this is true. This is true. And so I wanted more. And I, I fell in love with the Eucharist at that moment, which began my journey into the Catholic faith. And this priest friend of mine, seeing my hunger awaken, tried to, to get me connected up with a, a prayer group that was filled with the Holy Spirit, a charismatic prayer group. And the only ones he could find for me in, in the town where I lived was in were Catholic prayer groups. So and he did look for Protestant ones, you know, it, because I was Protestant, but he found only Catholic ones. So Ralph and I began to go to the Catholic prayer meetings to fill, to, to, to satisfy the hunger that had awakened you know, it, it awakened in Ralph too. That's another story. But as it awakened in me, it began to awaken in Ralph as I shared with him my journey. But in myself, the Holy Spirit began to, to call me and I began to feel, I became aware of it. Because something had happened in my conversations with this priest friend. And he didn't tell me about the Holy Spirit, but... As he told me about the Eucharist and the Holy Spirit began to, to confirm the validity of this in me, I was just consumed by desire to receive Jesus in the Eucharist and with that to have the fullness of God. The Eucharist gives us the fullness of God. Not just Jesus himself in fullness, but all of God, including the Holy Spirit. And so, you see what the Holy Spirit was doing? He was awakening in me a desire for that fullness. And my very first experience with that fullness was, I followed my priest friend from his vacation with us to a charismatic conference. This was back in 1977, and it was an interdenominational, international, huge charismatic conference in Kansas City, Missouri. And when I got there, the first workshop that I entered, they were doing some praise and worship music before the speaker began. And the people were all standing there deep in worship and joy, joyful worship, and they were singing in tongues. I'd never heard this before, but I instantly felt like it was the language of angels. And so I, 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 just, I just entered into that saying, wow, here's the supernatural that I've been seeking. And throughout that conference, I'm going, wow, the supernatural does exist in the church. And 
through being around 60,000 people who were praying in tongues, singing in tongues, I received that gift supernaturally. I call it by osmosis. I just was filled with the Holy Spirit. I was in an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit's presence was so pervasive. It was basically impossible for me to not absorb it, to not be influenced by it. And then you know what happened? When I went back home and I went to these charismatic prayer meetings, I heard teachings that I hadn't heard before. Or maybe I'd heard some of it, but it didn't make sense sense and didn't sink in, but now it did because the Holy Spirit was active and alive in me. The Holy Spirit began to convict me of every lie I was believing about the occult and other, and other lies as well, such as that abortion is not killing a child, it's just getting rid of some tissue, you know, some foreign tissue in your body. Uh, other, other things, other lies that I had believed because of what the world had taught me and what my upbringing had taught me, the mistakes, the, the errors, uh, the, the things about what's wrong with the Catholic Church, those kinds of lies and, and misunderstandings. All of this, one by one, got cleared up by the Holy Spirit. One by one, because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, he gives us only as much as we can handle, although now I was able to handle more than I could before. And so I was constantly being filled with, oh, so now that I understand that's a lie. And I don't want anything to do with that lie. Oh, that's a lie. Oh, that's not true. Oh, here's the truth about that. Oh, here's the truth about that. And I was just so excited to learn all these truths. I mean, it transformed me. It became the foundation for who I am today. It became the foundation for many years later, Good News Ministries getting started. All because I said, yes, I have a hunger to receive the fullness of God. When this happens, when the fullness of God comes upon us, because we humbly say, I'm wrong about what I've been believing and I want to know the truth. There are things that need to be routed out of my life and I want them routed out and I want to know the truth about this and I want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live the holy life. When we do that with all sincerity, the Holy Spirit so takes over, scriptures come alive, more than ever before. The teachings of the church come alive. When we hear a truth spoken maybe in a homily or, you know, in a newscast even, or uh, a comment that somebody makes to us, the Holy Spirit in us resonates with that and says, yes, this is true. And we recognize that resonating going on and we go, ah, oh, I accept this truth. And when it's not true, Something inside of us goes, Wing! it's not true. Send up a warning flag. Don't let her, don't let her know, don't let her think that this is, that this is true. Help her to know the truth about this. You know, warning, warning. This is how the Holy Spirit wants to work in you too, my friend. If you haven't yet experienced that, and if you have, by the way, there's always more. So keep asking for more. And, but if you haven't experienced it yet, Pray this prayer with me and pray it every day until you receive that special anointing of the Holy Spirit that totally consumes your life and brings you alive in faith that makes everything up until now seem like it's all been black and white and now you're living in, in full color. Okay, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Savior of the world and my Savior who died for me to set me free from Satan and all the lies of Satan. Forgive me for my sins. I do acknowledge that I have sinned 
and I do want to be set free from these sins. I want to repent from these sins, but I want you to help me know how I have been sinning so that I can repent. So send me your Holy Spirit in fullness. Father God, I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ to send your Holy Spirit to me in fullness. Come Holy Spirit, fill me. Come Holy Spirit, you have my permission to change me. Help me to be the saint that God the Father created me to be and that Jesus Christ died for me to become. Come Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you.